بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening dear viewers ladies and gentlemen Hello and welcome Dr. Mohamed Al-Shif your host of Elixir of Life kicking off another inspiring and informative episode about maternal fetal medicine with our distinguished guest Dr. Hisham Arab aiming to explore new frontiers and bring you the most up-to-date information related to health Remember Elixir of Life your best source of evidence-based medicine uh, stay tuned for a special episode. Don't go away. Come back. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now we'll go for the first segment of our uh, show. Will be quote of the week to see more details on this report. Once again, uh, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now, our next uh, segment will be medical news, and we'll talk about the fifth Middle East session of gastroenterology and nutrition in children at King Saud University. To see more details on this report, stay with us. Don't go away. With me here is Dr. Abdurrahman Al Muammar, CEO of the University of Medical City in King Saud University. Today we, uh, we find that it is one of the successful days that we always have in King Saud University here. Uh, Prince Abdullah bin Khalid, uh, celiac disease researcher, which is a uh, researcher that was developed mainly to enhance scientific uh, research as well as uh, training, education and enhance patient experience and also their knowledge in terms of the awareness about celiac disease in collaboration with different uh, society as well with us with K uh, college of medicine king saud university and with different organization within the kingdom and internationally we are conducting the fifth uh, middle east course uh, uh, as a continuous effort we uh, the, the researcher successfully uh, manage uh, actually to conduct uh, this event in a continuous fashion where they invited different speakers with different experience and knowledge uh, annually uh, uh, by this way they were to be able to attract students, postgraduate student, resident, as well as followers and all interested group in the uh, different diseases and specifically by, for gastroenterology, liver and nutrition for the pediatric patients in general. Uh, uh, the knowledge that they are going to share, the different experience that they are going to be exposed to, uh, the challenge, uh, challenging cases that they are going to discuss, if, uh, definitely is going to enhance the experience of every single person participating in this event. Uh, what's good about it today also that we are going to ha have speakers coming from United States uh, uh, of America, from the United Kingdom, from Egypt, from Kuwait, as well as from organization within the kingdom, specifically from the King Saud bin Abdul Aziz. Uh, uh, University for Health Specialities and also from the uh, Abdurrahman Faisal, uh, Prince Abdurrahman Faisal University in the in the MAM, uh, as well as from our speakers from King Saud University. So with me here is Dr. Nakhil Th uh, Thapper, a consultant pediatric a gastroenterologist from Great Ormond Street Hospital from London. So gastrointestinal disorders and disorders of nutrition are very common. So some of the commonest uh, conditions that present to hospital 
and we really need to educate uh, healthcare workers to, to be able to deal, to diagnose these. We still have many conditions which are still not diagnosed. We heard this morning, for example, celiac disease is very un underdiagnosed in Saudi Arabia. So we're trying with this forum to increase the education so we're able to uh, improve the diagnosis, the treatment of these conditions. With me here is Professor Asad Al Asiri, a consultant, pediatric, a pediatric a gastroenterologist, and also supervisor of the Prince Abdullah bin Khalid Celiac Disease Research Chair. Doctor, could you tell us a little bit about the celiac disease uh, symptoms and signs? Celiac disease is a, is a disease which uh, occurs in adults and children, and it is related to uh, eating of any food which contains gluten, like bread or biscuits. Or, or anything which contain uh, wheat. And the symptoms are mainly uh, diarrhea, which persists for some time, abdominal distension, short stature, uh, rickets, uh, paler, or anemia, which never respond to iron therapy. And of course, this disease uh, present with uh, some clinical signs, which is paler, or uh, whipping of the, uh, or bowing of the legs, or uh, dental caries, or abdominal distension, or growth failure, or short stature, or wasting in children. And of course, the diagnosis of this disease is mud, um, can, made, uh, can be made by a blood test, plus a biopsy from the small bowel. Indeed, doctor. Of course, we've got lots of uh, guest speakers in uh, uh, this year, uh, all uh, putting good words uh, to you and thanking you for uh, asking them to join and for inviting them to join in this uh, forum. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of this forum? Uh, this course, of course, is very important. It, it's conducted by uh, King Saud University Research Chairs, and it highlights uh, the disease like celiac disease or uh, esophageal uh, esophagitis, like allergic esophagitis, or it also highlight on the different milk formula in children and the diarrheal diseases and also inflammatory bowel disease. Indeed, uh, Professor Asad Al Asiri, thank you very much uh, for this great event uh, that you put together. Of course, you're the m you're the mastermind of this event, and we hope you all the success for the events to come. Thank you very much, Professor Asad. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Channel uh, Two for giving me the chance to, uh, to for this uh, interview. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Our next segment will be Health, Myth, and Fact. To watch more details in this report, stay with us. Don't go away. Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now we are coming to the most important segment of our episode. Our episode theme is prophylaxis in maternal fetal medicine. Pregnancy is a beautiful experience for any woman with a great expectations for happy ending. However, something might go wrong for the mother or the fetus where we need the help of maternal fetal medicine specialist. The key care in modern medicine is prevention and maternal diseases and critical complications during pregnancy that might affect both mother and fetus can be predicted 
in ample time to undertake the necessary measures to prevent its progress. It's my great pleasure to introduce my uh, special, distinguished, and esteemed uh, guest, Dr. Hisham Arab. Hello, Dr. Hisham Arab. Hello, good evening. Mm -hmm. It's really great pleasure and uh, honor being with us. Just some uh, introduction, if we mention uh, Matir Nufital Medicine in Saudi Arabia, usually is coined with Dr. Hisham Arab. Dr. Hisham Arab, he is uh, a chairman of Maternal Fetal Medicine Expert Group in the Arab world, and he's former secretary of, uh, and former secretary general of, and founder of Saudi Obigaini Society, and his current uh, society uh, secretary general of World uh, Association of Prenatal Medicine, and he's highly published more than 50 uh, publications in peer-reviewed journal, and author of one book about diabetes and uh, pregnancy. Welcome, Dr. Arab. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad, for this invitation. I'd like to greet you and our viewers for this uh, nice uh, time to be together. Yeah, actually, it's honor for us. You are raising the bar of our program. Without further ado, we'll go to such important and interesting topic. Uh, what's the uh, journey of uh, fetal uh, development from conception to delivery? Mm. Well, it's a nine months journey. Mm -hmm. So you can assume that the, this journey started with the sperm from the father and an oocyte or an egg from the mother mm -hmm. that really got fertilized together. And then this would take the trip along the fallopian tube, the tube that transmit from, egg, from, the, ov from the ovary mm -hmm. to the side of the womb. Mm -hmm. There where this implanted uh, fertilized egg start to grow mm -hmm. and the fetus goes through a stages of growth over the nine months the first three months are the most critical part of it which is the creation of its parts and that's why uh, the time um, that uh, really uh, can shape the fetus and shape its organs its um, outside appearance all take place in this stage which is what we call the first trimester of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Then the second trimester and the third trimester is a matter of just growth. The baby grows from a size of, for example, a small pea to the three kilogram baby that is delivered after nine months. So, um, of course, the, during this stage, there are many factors plays around. The most important one is the genetics, which mm -hmm. is really uh, half of it comes from the mother and half of it comes from the father. Mm -hmm. uh, to create this small new um, human being. And after that, of course, uh, the nourishment, okay, the whatever the mother actually is drinking or eating will be transmitted through the placenta and then through the umbilical cord into the fetus and then the fetus gets it, its oxygen and its mm -hmm. nutrients and that's how the fetus grows. And of course, the last stage, which is really an, in, in the important message that the baby gives to the mother, I am ready to come out. And this is the stage where delivery takes place with a little bit of effort from mom, the baby comes out crying in good health. Oh, what a great yani, experience, okay, uh, for the mother uh, and for the father. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, that's really important to uh, differentiate between uh, materno, uh, maternal fetal medicine specialist and obstetrician. Are they different or the same? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the maternal fetal medicine specialist started as a general obstetrician gynecologist. Mm. Great. He did, or he or she did, a training of obstetric gynecology, got qualified to practice obstetric gynecology. However, they spent two more years um, doing nothing but concentrating on the health of the mother in critical situations. That means when she's ill with a disease, mm -hmm. whether it is some hereditary or something that she had developed, whether it is related to her heart or kidneys or brain, whatever, neurological, or the health of the fetus. And this is the most important part because, as we all know, the fetus grows inside a small box, the womb. Mm -hmm. And it is close thing. However, the maternal fetal medicine specialist, he got the key and the art how he can diagnose and treat this fetus if something wrong with that baby during that development. Mm -hmm. 
So interesting. So the scope of maternal fetal medicine specialist is to take care of high risk pregnancy. Uh, can you define high risk pregnancy? Uh, yes, high risk pregnancy that means a, a mother who developed a disease of some kind mm -hmm. uh, during her pregnancy. Let it be blood pr high, high blood pressure mm -hmm. or diabetes or mm -hmm. maybe some neurological factors, some, sometimes immunological disease. So any disease that occur in, during pregnancy or even preceded the pregnancy mm -hmm. where the pregnancy becomes a little bit critical to manage. And here, uh, for example, you need the care of a nephrologist, but the maternal fetal medicine is more geared to manage that renal disease in this pregnancy because of his expertise. Mm -hmm. This is a critical pregnancy that we call. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the critical situation comes from the, the past history. For example, she gave birth to an abnormal fetus. That means she is really scared of having another one. And that's why she became critical. She needs the care of the maternal fetal specialist to um, maybe to predict or to assess mm -hmm. and how to manage her next pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so the theme, uh, I hear that you conducted very successful, very successful conference prophylaxis or prevention in maternal fetal medicine. How was the conference and what was the target audience? Mm. Mm. Okay, actually we just did this last month in Dubai. Um, the Arab maternal fetal medicine expert group is actually composed of maternal fetal medicine specialists across the Arab world from mm. the um, Arabian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we tried, I tried actually for over the last three years uh, to get them together in one meeting where we can discuss um, a theme uh, that is related to the health of the Arab woman. And um, uh, in fact, our target is all uh, doctors, whether they are in the training level or even specialized in obstetrics and gynecology, also nurses, midwives, in addition to other um, uh, link uh, uh, specialties that is related to the to this, for example, uh, pediatricians who really manage the heart of the fetus, mm -hmm. what we call the perinatal cardiologist, mm -hmm. or sometimes geneticists because they deal with hereditary diseases that can affect the fetus. So all these audience actually been uh, targeted, and we had more than 150 attendees over that uh, during that conference, and. Um, uh, it was actually one of the successful ones that we had um, throughout the last four, three or four years. Very interesting. Uh, so it's not it's crossing the borders of uh, Saudi Arabia. It's a pan-Arab. Uh, and you are the chair uh, person of uh, maternal fetal medicine expert group. So it's honor, okay, being uh, Saudi that chairing this very important uh, group or society? Hmm. Actually, I'm privileged to do that and I, um, I'm lucky when I was elected to do this um, from my past experience and from some connections with uh, different Arab doctors, not just within the Arab world, but in fact, I know friends who are, for example, Syrian, Lebanese or Sudanese or um, Jordanian who are abroad in Europe or in um, USA or Canada. Um, and they want to at least to feel the Arab style of medicine right. and they've been there too long so mm -hmm. uh, they asked me can we join these things I said the all, by all means because at least may have they may have more um, facilities they may have been exposed to higher education and be, beside that I have my friends and colleagues also within the Arab world that I always communicate with and all of a sudden, we got this concept, this from this Arab group. Mm -hmm. And for example, the last meeting, we have uh, Dr. George Haddad. He's Lebanese, but he's living all his life in mm -hmm. France. Um, he's a pioneer in the field of ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had a really good time um, exchanging knowledge and information. Excellent. So the speakers, this is leading to the speakers. Speakers not from Saudi Arabia, not from the Arab world, also from North America and Europe. Yes, they are mixed, and actually I always try to get Arab 
doctors, mm -hmm. okay? Um, with all respect to the British or um, American or Canadian, they have, the ex they have lots of expertise there. But since we have also Arab expertise in these countries, why should I invite the, the American or the Canadian? I invite the Arab expert mm -hmm. to come and join us. So uh, you can say that in this meeting that I held just a month ago, we had 100% Arab doctors there, speakers talking about students. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about the Arab world, I mean, um, I, there were about 10 Arab countries were presented in that meeting. Mm -hmm. That's uh, stunning and wonderful. Uh, what were the main themes of uh, this conference? Mm. Well, uh, the theme actually was mainly uh, preventing um, problems or diseases in the mother or the fetus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all know that um, an ounce of prevention is better than um, a kilogram of um, uh, treatment. Okay. <laughs> so it seems to be that um, uh, we had this concept, just uh, two or three of us, that we thought about, let's take it from the uh, ground and from the roots. How can we prevent diseases, or at least we can do something about um, uh, critical condition to the mother or a disease that may affect the fetus during its development uh, so that we can uh, we, end up, we don't end up having uh, abnormal babies or uh, dead babies. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so you have uh, covered very important uh, themes. If we can dissect them, okay, uh, one by one, it will be important. So about prevention of one of the main uh, themes, prevention of blood clot during pregnancy and postpartum period and recurrent uh, pregnancy loss. Can you enlighten well, us, Dr. Zan? Blood clot, really, it is a, a disaster. And um, uh, just give me an, an, an estimation about this problem uh, and the this, uh, size of it. If you talk about um, 10,000 women who are not pregnant, four of them will get the clot. But if you take 10,000 pregnant women, they have at least 28 to, thir to 40 women will develop that clot, whether during the pregnancy or during the postpartum period, mm -hmm. which is the six weeks postpartum. So it shows you that how the influence of pregnancy really matter in this situation like this. Mm -hmm. During pregnancy, the blood start to get thicker a little bit, what we call coagulable. That means it's prone to develop the clot. And that's why, and that's for many reasons for this. One of them is because of the increase um, of volume of the blood. And number two is because of the stagnation. The blood doesn't flow very well to towards the heart because of the increased size of the womb of the mm. mother. And that's why it may, she may develop the clot in her legs or somewhere. Um, for this reason, uh, we need to do something about it. We don't want to see 20 or 40 women developing clot just because they're clot pregnant. Mm -hmm. So here is we are, what we're doing. Actually, we have identified high-risk women, those mm -hmm. who are more likely to develop that clot. And for these high-risk um, women, we can say, we can give them what we call a blood thinner, just an injection that we can give it um, throughout the pregnancy or uh, during the postpartum period. All depends on her situation. We have identified these risk factors. So we have a mission now, in fact, I've been going through the uh, different cities in, in Saudi Arabia. We have visited about eight or 10 cities so far, educating doctors and telling them what are those risk factors that you have to identify. explore, identify in any pregnant woman that comes to your office. So if she fits or within those risk factors, you should start your treatment with the blood thinner in order to avoid the clot. Prevention, we said preventive, preventive uh, measures. Yes, preventive Absolutely. measures. Absolutely. So this is, that's why always Hippocrates said that to treat, uh, to prevent the disease is better than cure, okay? Absolutely. So right now in the antenatal care uh, clinic, uh, prevention of blood clot is, is part of the strategies, okay? Yes. Am I right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I have uh, a news that's really um, of uh, the press, I can say that. Um, just today I received the um, gala proof of the Saudi guidelines on preventing 
the clot during pregnancy and the postpartum. This is a work I've been uh, doing it with um, uh, another eight or nine colleagues. What we formed a committee um, to look into this, um, keeping in mind the, the cultural um, attitude, the behavioral mm -hmm. attitude, even the obstetric pattern and behavior of, these, of the mm -hmm. Saudi woman, uh, with the knowledge that we have gained from American or the British um, or Canadian mm -hmm. um, guidelines. And we developed now what we call the Saudi algorithm. Um, it's just going to be published in February issue uh, this month, and hopefully we can take this to all doctors in Saudi Arabia. That's really great uh, news to hear uh, that. Uh, now we're going to the next uh, main uh, focus of the conference was the prevention of congenital malformation. I know it's very bad experience for the mother to have congenital uh, malformation. So how to uh, prevent uh, this? Mm. Absolutely. I mean, this is something started a few years ago when we noticed that lots of babies, they have um, an opening in the back where the, uh, the spinal column is just open and you can see the nerves coming out or sometimes maybe a defect in the skull of the baby. So uh, this is what we call the neural tube defects. And uh, from several studies, we have found that folic acid is the best way to prevent this congenital anomaly. Mm -hmm. And that's why for over the last several years, we have been instructing doctors to give the woman the folic acid, not just from the time she got pregnant, but at least two or three months before she gets pregnant, because the development, as I was saying earlier, it occurs very early in the first nine or 10 days of the development of the fetus where these, what we call the neural tubes start to close. Mm -hmm. If there was a deficiency in folic acid, then more likely um, this tube will remain open and will have this congenital anomaly. Mm -hmm. So this is one way of prophylaxis, preventing a congenital anomaly. Another way of pre preventing congenital anomaly is, for example, diagnosing a problem within the fetus in utero. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talk about a lazy thyroid, hypothyroidism. We can now diagnose hypothyroidism in the fetus. Mm, very so interesting. Absolutely. And instead of the fetus start to grow its thyroid to compensate for that hypothyroidism stage, and a baby born with a big mass in the neck, which represent that grown thyroid. Now we can diagnose this. We can give the mother the thyroid um, treatment um, or we sometimes we instill it inside the amniotic fluid mm -hmm. and the baby will get elect, um, uh, the thyroid hormone mm -hmm. so it doesn't need to grow its thyroid and will have a baby born without um, an abnormality in the neck. Mm -hmm. Another example for with the, with the congenital anomalies, uh, we can see that sometimes for um, children who had, uh, for example, um, blocked urethra, that means the fetus has kidneys, mm -hmm. has bladder, but the, w the urine usually it flows out of the bladder into the surrounding, which formulate the amniotic fluid mm -hmm. what we talk about. However, sometimes the outlet is closed. And for that reason, there is a small surgery that one of the earlier surgeries I've been doing here in Saudi Arabia, which is really make putting a catheter mm -hmm. inside the bladder of the baby, one end of it, and the other end outside into the amniotic mm -hmm. sac. And that's why the urine will be emptied from the bladder into the amniotic sac around it, and hence will not have a problem. These babies, if th we did not save them from this abnormality, mm -hmm. they may have a problem to do with the kidneys, they may even lose the kidneys, mm -hmm. and as you know, I mean, we don't, lo we don't do renal transplants for a newborn, so these babies, could, we could even lose them at birth because of this abnormality. Uh, I think related to this question, uh, do we have uh, centers of excellence for fetal uh, surgery in Arab world and in Saudi Arabia? Mm. Yes, actually, Saudi Arabia is one of the pioneer in the field of fetal surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, I was the, feet, the first maternal fetal medicine specialist who came to Saudi Arabia in 1989. <laughs> um, at uh, the National Guard Hospital and at the military hospital, I formed uh, the first fetal medicine units. 
there were I used to get even some trainees coming from Canada to mm -hmm. um, to give them some training on fetal surgery mm -hmm. and then we had an, another center in Riyadh the King Faisal Special Hospital the, um, a big team there they're doing even now more advanced fetal surgery and once I start doing the Arab um, uh, pan Arab um, group. I learned that there is um, a small center in Beirut. Uh, people, the there Beirut. experts mm. coming from France, they're doing surgery. Um, the uh, unfortunately Egypt is a little behind, but now I think there is one center start to develop in in uh, Cairo. Um, they're doing also some advanced fetal surgery. So, um, as you know, I mean there are some other countries. For example, the other Arab Gulf countries. Um, they may, don't, may not have the expert there, but what they do, they bring an expert from Belgium, from mm. um, UK or Canada to do that surgery for that particular patient and go back. Visitor doctor, okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's honor for us in Riyadh, we have two centers, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and in uh, Jeddah, we have one. Jeddah, one. Okay, yes. that's really great. Now going to next uh, theme of the conference: prevention of hereditary uh, diseases. Okay, mm. Mm. this is very, very new. In fact, in the field of maternal fetal medicine, even uh, something that when I was in training doing maternal fetal medicine, I didn't really learn. But with the development of another technology, a technology that we are doing now very often, which is the in vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. the IVF. Mm -hmm. This test tube technique now put that fetus when it start to be just fertilized, the sperm and the, and the, um, the egg, it's all under our eyes here and all under our touch. We can do anything at this stage in the first eight cells, only eight cell oh. stage. We can do lots of things. And here the geneticist whom they used to do this technique on adults, on blood from adults, we stole their technology and we applied it on our fetus that is only, or embryo that is only eight cells in size. Mm -hmm. What do you do? What we call the pre-implantation genetic analysis. Pre-implantation genetic. Pre-implantation. Before we put that fetus inside. So for example, this is to do it with lots of the single gene disorders, a hereditary disease that occur because of one problem with, uh, with a problem with one gene, and that can be transmitted from fam through families. Tay Sach disease is something to do with d different population. Maybe mm -hmm. you see it in Jews or in, in, in North American. But sickle cell disease, okay. thalassemia, it's very common in Saudi Arabia. We have two hot spots, one in Jizan and one in the Eastern Province. Yes. Very common thalassemia center. And you all know how these babies when, or children when they are born and they get blood transfusions, they don't live longer and all this. Now we can diagnose this. And uh, how actually we, from this eight cell stage embryo before, after the fertilization, and the mother is waiting for us to put that in her womb, we can test these embryos for that particular gene and decide whether this embryo is affected or not. Yeah. And then if we have, for example, four embryos, we can bring the mother and tell, okay, listen, we have two of them affected and two of them are okay. So what we do, of course, we take the good ones and we put it in her womb and this way, she's going to have a healthy baby. She doesn't need to worry about that particular disease. That's why I always say we can even, if we do this in every pregnancy, mm -hmm. we can prevent a hereditary disease from extending into generation because there is no more a disease or a carrier person in that family. Mm -hmm. So not only in vitro fertilization, any uh, pregnancy that you expect hereditary disease, Exactly. Any woman who had a, um, a, a hereditary disease that can be tested, we have to bring her through this channel, through the IVF, the fetal fertilization, in order to do the PGD, what we call the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And after that, we just transfer the healthy, good embryo. Yeah, this is actually a major uh, revolution in the maternal fetal medicine. Absolutely, and that's why I was really keen in order to bring this subject to the surface, to 
um, even not just for doctors to be aware of it, even for the public sometimes, because they are the one who are suffering. A woman who had a child with, who, with thalassemia and she's every day going back into, to the hospitals with different either infection yes, or pain suffering. or blood transfusion, it's very sad. But when she knows there is something like this occurring, she'll contact the right person to do this. Oh yeah, very impressive uh, news. Now we want to shift the gear to uh, gestational diabetes mellitus or diabetes mellitus of pregnancy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very um, interesting topic because I love this topic anyway. Because you authored the book I, about I wrote a book about yeah. this, and recently one um, um, Croatian um, professor asked me even to uh, write for him a chapter in his book around book, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is uh, diabetes that is diagnosed during the pregnancy. So it's only occurring during pregnancy. And we were started to wonder why? Okay, if she's already diabetic and she got pregnant, that's another story. I mean, okay, that's we can manage her pregnancy according to her condition, just like any other disease. But why a healthy woman who is supposed to know that she's healthy, she has nothing else, but suddenly she's diabetic while she's pregnant? There must be some problems there. And that's why we started to look again into risk factors, because this is the, our starting point. One very, very important factor that lead to the development of diabetes in pregnancy is obesity. Obesity. So we started to look into this, and we, we found that the, if the woman started with high BMI, what we call the body mass index, which is the relation between her weight and her height, if that is high over, for example, the 30, then the figure is of 30, she started her pregnancy with that high, weight and she accumulated also large weight we allow a healthy woman uh, who is non obese to grow uh, to gain 12 kilograms 12 kilograms during the nine nine months but if she put for example 20 kilogram a doctor while she is following with him or her should be alerted mm -hmm. this is a patient who is already obese and she's accelerating her weight also, mm -hmm. she is a very high risk to develop diabetes and she should be tested and more likely she'll have gestational diabetes that will last throughout pregnancy. And when she comes after six weeks after delivery, you test her, you find her healthy, no mm -hmm. diabetes. So this kind of diabetes is preventable. Mm -hmm. How? I tell this woman, before you decide of getting pregnant, and you know that you're obese, try to cut down your weight. So this is very important that they should lose weight. Weight before it's pregnant. This brought us now recently to talk about bariatric surgery. Mm. For this operation that the gastric bypass or gastric banding or the sleeve, sleeve operations, yes, okay. this which is really a woman lose lots of weight. Suppose she is 130 kilogram or 140 mm -hmm. kilograms, poor lady. You know, it's very important that she put out 40, 60 kilogram. There is no way she can do that without the surgery, mm -hmm. I think. Now we have reports just published in, uh, I mean, December 2016 from North America saying that those who had gone through this metabolic surgery, we call them, metabolic surgery, they fare much better in pregnancy. They have less incidence of diabetes. Even they have actually, uh, they grow uh, um, or gain little weight compared to the other woman who did not have the surgery. Mm -hmm. So number one fact is to cut down on the weight before starting pregnancy. The most so important point. This mm -hmm. is the prophylaxis that I tell them. Mm -hmm. Exercise with diet, with dieting. Dieting alone is not enough. Exercise is very important. The other factor is we have now what we call um, a, a new drug called the metformin. Um, this is um, anti-insulin, um, which is really help in the um, mm -hmm. management of the pathology that is behind gestation and diabetes. So we found that also um, uh, giving these medications before and during pregnancy mm -hmm. let the woman, accumul uh, woman accumulate less uh, weight and so she'll be less prone to develop um, gestational diabetes. I think very important point relevant to this 
to if the a woman developed gestational diabetes mellitus what about the next uh, pregnancy is it the way to prevent or any woman who developed diabetes during pregnancy more prone to develop uh, diabetes in the next pregnancy absolutely she has a very high chance about 50 percent okay chance of developing another gestational diabetes in her next pregnancy. Not only that, but also she has about 5 to 10 percent chance of being diabetic, diabetic. for the rest of no. her life. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. Um, there is also some reports now talking about the child that was born as a result of, just, uh, the, of, of a mother who, was, who had gestational diabetes is prone to be obese and diabetic in the future. Oh, that's very scary okay yeah. so that's important for many aspects for long term okay uh, development of diabetes for next pregnancy for the fetus okay so it has multifaceted okay um, it, it is uh, some women may think it is something simple or maybe I am I'm, I'm eating too much because I'm, I'm, I'm pregnant or she's under the influence of the family you are pregnant you have to eat for two which is really wrong, you know. Wrong, okay. Um, so it's very important to watch how much, um, much weight, and it's simple. If you avoid starting the pregnancy with high weight, and if you reduce the weight that you gain during pregnancy, definitely you will not get mm -hmm. gestational diabetes. Uh, now we will go to something very, you know, uh, common uh, during uh, pregnancy: toxemia of pregnancy or hypertension uh, or pregnancy-induced hypertension. How we prevent uh, this uh, important uh, disease during pregnancy? Uh, definitely, there is um, something to do with the um, history of the of the patient herself. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, for a new pa patient, maybe it's difficult, but for somebody who had experienced um, hypertension in her pregnancy in the, in the past, this woman we can follow her very closely from the beginning. And there are many ways. There is, we can use what we call the ultrasonic Doppler examination of the uterine arteries. So we can measure the blood flow into her womb mm -hmm. from the early stage, from her third month or fourth month. And we can assess from that whether she is going to be hypertensive or not. Uh -huh. So here is we collecting clues because if we diagnose that she is going to develop this problem, the first thing we do is we, starting her, we start her on aspirin. aspirin okay. We give two tablets of aspirin at, um, uh, at in the evening time for her from the time we diagnose this in the early trimester, first trimester. This lady should not develop that hypertension that she had in the past. Okay, very but just because we, we diagnose the problem early and uh, we made sure that she got the prophylaxis aspirin. Uh, and here is a very important note, I should say really, for my colleagues and doctors, I have seen patients, they just been put on aspirin haphazardly, which mm. is wrong. Wrong. Huh? I mean, you, you sh just don't say, okay, so she won't have hypertension, I just give her aspirin. It's aspirin is a medication, it has also its side effects, and when it, whenever it is indicated, yes, we give it, because um, this way we are preventing a problem, so in, even if there were side effects, at least we have something to uh, deal with the least problem, at least. Mm -hmm. But for a patient who is healthy, there is no um, um, actually indication. Uh, you started this um, episode by saying it's an evidence-based um, um, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, like a program. I'd like to uh, base our facts on, on, uh, on evidence. evidence. Okay. And here it's one important thing that aspirin use in pregnancy is only in one situation like this, mm -hmm. maybe another stage, uh, another situation. But definitely we should not put every woman on aspirin from the mm -hmm. beginning. So what we mentioned, what you mentioned, Doctor uh, Hisham, that the use of the ultrasound to detect the blood the flow in the womb. Yes. Okay, so th is it this is a state of art or uh, age uh, cutting uh, advance, and or this has been used for a long time? Well, it's been used for some time, but to advance it to the first trimester, this is new. Okay, I mean. Right. Uh, um, this is uh, actually coming from our physiology. Mm -hmm. When we started to learn about 
toxemia in pregnancy and how, what these women are suffering. And when we started dissecting even the placenta and uh, part of the wall of the womb that is attached to it, mm -hmm. we found those women, unfortunately, have narrow um, capillaries or blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And that is the actual pathology. So, of course, for a pregnant woman, we cannot go in and take a biopsy and all this. But in, in, in an indirect way, in we can measure way. the mm -hmm. blood flow through these vessels. So then we can say whether this blood flow is impaired or is it flowing normally. And here we can detect the tables. That's very nice. Okay, uh, and advance in uh, maternal fetal medicine. Now to go, how to prevent uh, fetal uh, infections? It's a very common question, actually, I get in, in my clinic. A woman comes and, say, and she said, I have a cat in my house. Mm -hmm. Am I prone for an infection, which we call the toxoplasmosis, mm -hmm. all right? Well, it's important that this is one of the infections that the fetus may, may really get. And, but it is very important also to understand the pathophysiology, how this thing occurred. Well, of course, I mean, if you have a cat, you have to take it to the, um, um, the doctor and mm -hmm. um, uh, to look into the situation and make sure the cat is... To the clinic, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in order to take the immunization, all, the, all these things. So it's, and this is important factor that maybe we can deal with. Mm -hmm. But there is another thing, which is the um, rare meat, which is really uh, more important than just uh, dealing with cats in the house. So fetal infection, in a way, can be, pro I mean, looked into also from a different angle that it is something can be prevented if we follow the right um, um, procedures, taking the cat to the veteran, the, I mean, mm. uh, prevent uh, not eating um, raw meat. What we are doing now in uh, some later stages, a little bit of infection, is not toxoplasmosis, it's something to do with the, what we call some type of viruses. Mm -hmm. um, these viruses sometimes cause hyper, um, li li um, uh, um, quick or like uh, um, hyperviscosity within the brain or within the tissues. So this uh, fast flow of the uh, blood again can be measured. And one way of looking into this is to measure what we call the middle cerebral artery, small mm -hmm. artery in the brain the of brain. the fetus. The fetus. Okay. Yes, in the fetus. And we can insinuate with this with the ultrasound using the Doppler and see the, f uh, the blood flow and its speed in doing this. From there, we can tell whether this baby is really having a hyper, uh, like a, a hyper flow in the vessels due to the infection itself or not. So if it is, then we can start the treatment. There is antiviral now treatments for it. There's some time if we, um, uh, other infections, antibacterial infection, um, medications. So these kind of um, uh, measures can be taken early and we can diagnose the situation. Sometimes we can abort the, the situation before that baby is born. Mm -hmm. So the infections mainly talk about toxoplasmosis and some uh, viruses. Yes. What are the viruses that you uh, mean? Well, um, there, there are many viruses that can affect. I mean, for example, we talk about the rubella vaccine. Rubella, okay. okay. Rubella so is one of the So that's why vaccination. Because of vaccination. But usually the rubella is somebody, again, who uh, hasn't been tested in her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If we do the blood test for the rubella and find out this woman is non-immune, that she says she is not having any antibodies in her circulation. So we at least we can warn her. Tell her if you see a child who has this measles appearance, just don't come near that child. Stay away because you are prone. You don't have the immunity to fight this infection. Mm -hmm. This is in a way of prophylaxis, just telling her to avoid. And this is only done by simple tests, blood tests, to whether to find out if she's immune or not. Um, uh, there are some other viruses um, related to with the like um, um, it causes a little bit of um, uh, fever and uh, sometimes maybe rashes in the, in the, in the mother. She, it's not really a major problem, but 
whenever we find out in the fetus, because this is one thing of follow-up. Whenever we see some abnormality in the fetus, sometimes we see what we call white spots in the brain or in the, in the liver. That's an indication that maybe there's an infection there, what we call mm -hmm. the fetal infection. Mm -hmm. Then we have to do many tests for this to identify, start treatment, and avoid mm -hmm. the main problem. Uh, doctor, just going to the last uh, theme of your uh, conference, uh, how to prevent uh, fetal growth uh, retardation or restriction, and in a brief, and I would like you to give us your take home uh, message. Okay. Mm. Um, growth restriction of the fetus is something to do with the nutrition. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, it's very important. We, I, in the beginning, when I talk about gestation and diabetes, I'm talking about overeating, but also starvation, fasting is not a good thing. All right? And that's why there may be a chance, lean woman who, who is not like the other extreme, I'm talking about not the very obese, we're talking about the very lean woman who is very thin and not eating well. Maybe she's smoking, drinking lots of coffee. Very likely her baby will be very tiny, small, not growing very well, not much fat under the skin around this fetus. And more likely this fetus will suffer from either sometimes what we call lack of growth or in addition, that baby might even die inside the, wom uh, the womb. So what we call that, we call stillbirth. So these, these situations are, again, something to do with the nutrition, but it's very important that we detect it early before we uh, let pregnancy continue. Um, um, just to summarize, maybe... Um, um, just take home messages for take very important, okay, uh, interview. Mm. I, my advice to the woman herself, before you plan pregnancy, before you decide on pregnancy, you have to plan for it, okay? Um, just like when you want to go to a party, you know, you dress well, you do whatever makeup you can what, and do other things, that's the same thing here. You plan to have a baby, all right? Think first of your weight. If you, but your weight is high, come down with your weight and, um, uh, and, and also um, improve your dieting. Usually uh, those obese women, maybe they have wrong way of eating and that has to be uh, improved if ex uh, doing the exercises. And also sometimes need to do some blood tests just to make sure that she is not immune to infection, whatever. So that's preparation for pregnancy. And another thing is once she is pregnant, she has to start to take the folic acid. That's the first, even if she goes by herself, before she sees the doctor, take folic acid from even if you're not taking it, take folic acid before you get pregnant or continue throughout the thir first three months. Mm -hmm. And number three is that don't miss an appointment with your obstetrician gynecologist. Mm -hmm. It's very important. If he I'll ask you to come once a month, that's fine. If he asks you to come every two weeks, there must be a reason you should come earlier. So antenatal follow-up is an essential part of the health of the mother and her fetus. And I hope um, all women will have the best outcome throughout their life. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hisham Arab, uh, for a great uh, interview. You enlightened us about a very important uh, topic. Just to mention again, Dr. Hisham Arab is a consultant uh, maternal fetal medicine and a chairman of Arab uh, maternal fetal uh, medicine expert group. Thank you. It was really a pleasure and honor being with us. The pleasure is mine. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad, and thanks for the audience for, and the viewers. Now we are going to the last uh, segment of our uh, program. Uh, we'll talk about the health benefit. To see more details in this report, stay with us. Don't go away.
Once again, welcome back to Elixir of Life. Now we are coming to the end of our uh, program. We wish you have enjoyed uh, watching our episode and found it uh, useful, uh, informative, and enlightening. Uh, remember that knowledge is uh, power and awareness is the best prevention. With this, we are coming to the end. We uh, thank our uh, great and distinguished uh, team, cameraman uh, Salman Arabi, uh, Ahmed Al Gahtani, sound uh, Muhammad Al Ghasim, uh, Diko Ibrahim uh, Al Khunain, uh, Light uh, Fawaz Al Rusayis, prepared by Rahab Al Khalitit and presented by me, Muhammad Al Sheif, and assistant director Firas Al Kinani, director Abdullah Al Wulayi. Until uh, next uh, week, we wish you a pleasant week ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Goodbye.